Good evening, everyone. Mike Palmer from Know Your Rights Group and Success Coaching International with another very important live video update tonight. So I've got a couple of different uh, topics that I want to cover tonight. And uh, given that next Thursday is actually Anzac Day, uh, just a heads up, there won't be another video until uh, the following Sunday night. So uh, keep that in mind. We do obviously have a bit to uh, get through between now and then. So uh, let's get straight into it. First up tonight, I do want to uh, address a very interesting speeding case where the uh, Supreme Court dismissed the case of a driver who was supposedly driving at more than 50 kilometres an hour over the posted speed limit. Now, before I read this article, I want to say that we don't in any way, shape or form condone excessive speeding or anything like that. But uh, clearly in this instance, uh, the uh, judge has ruled that that was not actually the case. And it does raise some interesting points. So uh, this is the article. And as always, I do urge you to go and uh, source this article and read it for yourselves. So it says, driver of car clocked 51 kilometers per hour over limit in Seacliff Park wins appeal against speeding conviction. A motorist has successfully appealed a speeding conviction in South Australia's Supreme Court, which means that it can be relied upon anywhere in Australia as a precedence, despite initially being found to have been traveling more than 50 kilometers per hour over the speed limit. Justice Malcolm Blue found police had not proven that the speed gun had been operated correctly. Important point. In his judgment, Justice Blue said the affidavit from Senior Constable Lee Greenwood, which stated the radar gun had showed Mr. Zephy was driving his Holden Commodore at 111 kilometers per hour in a 60 kilometer hour zone, was not enough to prove his guilt. Was not enough to prove his guilt. Very important. It is not possible to draw an inference that Senior Constable Greenwood correctly operated the leader or speed gun, Justice Blue said. It may well be that he did so. However, it is simply speculative on the evidence adduced as to whether he did so. It follows that the evidence was incapable of proving correct operation of the leader and hence of proving that Mr. Zephy's Commodore was traveling at 111 kilometers per hour. Given this conclusion, I have no option but to acquit Mr. Zephy of the offense. Justice Blue said police must not just prove that the speed camera was accurate through calibration certificates, but also prove that it had been operated properly. Very important point. He said the magistrate made an error when they reversed the onus of proof and asked the defense to prove the radar gun had not been had not been operated correctly. The obvious analogy is that a rifle may be perfectly made and accurate within itself, but if it is not skillfully used on a particular occasion, the target will likely be missed, Justice Blue said. To pursue the rifle analogy, the certificate procedure may assist the prosecution to prove the rifle is accurate within itself, but it says nothing as to the person using it. Okay, now we've covered this many, many times before, and now we've finally got the court confirming it. Appropriate use of the device on the particular occasion had to be proven by the prosecution to the normal standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt. Very important words. The onus is on the prosecution to prove the charge. Now the police and the courts and the prosecutors will always try and say, oh, you have to prove that you didn't. No. As we've said a million times before, the onus is on the prosecution to prove their charge beyond a reasonable doubt, which includes proving that the lead our gun was properly operated. The judgment found that in this particular case, prosecution had not proved that the device used to detect Mr. Zephy's vehicle was properly operated. South Australian police would not be drawn on whether the case created a precedent. And all you need to do is look into the Commonwealth Constitution uh, and see that that's exactly what's happened. Any court that is, uh, any ruling that's made in the Supreme Court or above can be relied upon in all of the states. So it most assuredly does create a precedent. So uh, there's some key points there 
uh, from that article and from that ruling that we've been teaching people for years in our live events. Now, firstly, the courts and police prosecutors, as I said before, love to try and reverse that burden of proof back onto the defendants. But as the judge correctly ruled, they simply cannot do that. And if they do try and do that to you, then simply do what this gentleman did and make sure you appeal. Keep fighting, don't just roll over at the first court ruling. And secondly, we give numerous examples in our seminars of specifically how these devices are used incorrectly all the time. It happens all the time. So please, on that point, if you wanna learn all of these types of things, burden of proof requirements, things about the Commonwealth Constitution, how devices are used incorrectly, and a heap of other things, then please make sure you check out the dates for our upcoming live events for this year, because our first event is on in Sydney in just two weeks' time. It's actually two weeks as of tomorrow, okay? And unfortunately, as I've said before, due to uh, you know, a range of uh, different factors, these will actually be the last live events that we will be doing for the foreseeable future. So you can find out uh, all the details uh, of those live events, including the dates that we're in you know, each particular city, the specific topics that we cover on each day, the start and, time, uh, start and finish times for each day, uh, as well as obviously securing your seats via the links on our seminar page. Uh, so if you just go to knowyourrightsgroup.com.au, click on the seminar uh, tab, you'll find all those details. There should be a link in the description of this video and also in the comment section. Now, if you can't get to those live events uh, you know, for one reason or another, uh, or if you can't wait to learn some of these uh, important things, especially uh, in relation to speeding fines, then please do make sure you uh, grab a copy of that uh, Aussie Speeding Fines uh, book. In particular, you want to make sure that you uh, refer to chapter six, and I'm going to read just a few uh, key points out of uh, chapter six here. Things like uh, slip and sweep error, uh, resulting in a reading which is higher or lower than the true speed of a vehicle. Happens all the time. Uh, laser devices, LIDARs, as we just discussed in that particular article. Program is intended to eliminate the possibility of unexplained readings. That's what it's designed to do. It doesn't say it does do it. Uh, you're going to love this one. There are many forms of interference that may affect a radar instrument. However, they are too numerous to mention. To conclude, interference always has a reason. However, the reasons are often impossible to explain as there are too many var variables that have to be considered. Okay, These are just some of the extracts from the actual manufacturer's training manuals for these devices Okay, that the Aussie Speeding Fines guys include Okay, in their, uh, in their book. So uh, please, if you don't yet have uh, that book, uh, you will find a link in the description. You will find a link in the comment section. So please uh, make sure you grab that book. Um, all right. So uh, moving on, uh, whilst we're on the subject of uh, fines, for those of you who might be in Queensland or might be considering travelling to Queensland, please make sure that you are aware of the new roadwork speed cameras uh, that they are now rolling out up in Queensland. So uh, again, this is the article for those of you who want to uh, read that for yourselves. And it says Queensland's roadworks speed cameras to issue fines from next month following delays in rollout. New cameras in Queensland that were meant to nab speeding drivers at roadwork sites have not assigned a single fine more than 18 months after the road safety initiative was supposed to begin. So there is some good news, but of course, it's not all good news. The Department of Transport and Main Roads said the cameras were expected to start issuing fines next month once operational trials of the technology finished. The government first unveiled the Roadworks Camera Initiative in August 2021, then subsequently announced in 2022 that the cameras would go live from September that year. However, TMR has confirmed the cameras have not actually given out any fines and have so far only been capturing vehicle speed data. I wonder if they've been capturing any data on how many accidents there are or aren't occurring in those areas, whether the cameras are working or not. Hmm, that might be important information. On Wednesday, Transport Minister Bart Mellish conceded he was disappointed 
that the cameras had not yet issued any fines. I guess he needs a little bit of money. Of course, the uh, safety of both motorists and workers who are working on our infrastructure build across the state is paramount, he said. Again, where's the data showing how many accidents are actually occurring in roadworks areas? Because I'm sure all of you out there have been as frustrated as I have over the years about having to slow down to 40 k's in a roadwork area only to find that there's no actual roadwork going on at all because there's nobody there. I'll be asking the department some serious questions about this because for me, that's not acceptable. If we're not issuing fines when we're supposed to be issuing fines. He seems to be really focused on fines there, doesn't he? All about the money. Not actually worried about on the safety data. I'm not you know, asking serious questions about how many accidents have occurred in roadworks areas in the last few years. He doesn't seem to be asking that. Only concerned about that they're not issuing fines when they should be. I'm sure you can connect the dots there. Meanwhile, TMR has released new data to ABC Radio Brisbane that shows new speed cameras attached to school zone signs have issued over 10,000 fines since they became operational in August. 10,000 fines since August. That's, what, six, seven months? That seems to be a lot of fines. Again, how many accidents were really occurring? And is that justification of fines and, of course, money-making really warranted? Between August 7 and March 22, the school zone cameras gave out 7,105 fines to drivers caught speeding in the lower tier of only up to 10 kilometres an hour over the limit. Again, how many accidents occurred in that speed range and does that warrant the issuing of fines to 7,000 people? Both the school zone and roadwork cameras are subject to a pilot which is due to finish in June 2025. The pilot will be evaluated to determine the road safety benefits and technical performance of the technology, the TMR spokesperson said. And I wonder whether they'll evaluate how much money they've made from those cameras during that period as well. So, uh, yeah, look, this is uh, really important. Let's actually see whether they release the data showing how many accidents they were either in these school zones or in these roadwork zones before the cameras went live, and then again after the cameras went live, and of course compare that to how much revenue they made from them. Again, I urge anyone to please make sure that you challenge any and all unjust and unlawful fines using that three-step process from chapter three of that Aussie Speeding Fines book, okay? That is what you need to do to challenge all unjust and unlawful fines. Okay, so on to the other news for this week. And once again, there has been another very serious data breach that could potentially affect hundreds of thousands of Aussies. So again, I urge you, please make sure you look up this article, especially if you have a smoke detector or smoke alarm in your house, which I believe everybody should do. So this may very well affect you or someone that you know. Uh, The article is entitled, Homeowners Urged to be Vigilant for Scams After Shocking Data Breach at Major Smoke Alarm Provider. A shocking three-month oversight by a major Aussie company has put hundreds of thousands of people at risk of being targeted by criminals. One of Australia's largest smoke alarm companies left hundreds of thousands of documents containing sensitive customer information exposed online for nearly three months where they were very likely accessed by malicious actors, a cybersecurity researcher has warned. Smoke Alarm Solutions, which operates in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and South Australia, has serviced two million 2 million properties since 2007 and less and left 762,856 so it's it's you know nearly 763,000 documents totaling 107 gigabytes in a non password protected database according to cybersecurity researcher Jeremiah Fowler the revelation is perfect timing Mr. Fowler said, coming just days after the consumer watchdog warned of a surge in fake invoice scams, which have cost Australians more than $16 million in the past 12 months. It is very likely the information was accessed by hackers. 
actually because the bad guys are looking for the same data that I'm looking for, except when I find it, I verify, validate and report it, but the bad guys are using it as a tool for scams, phishing attempts, anything they can get, the Germany-based researcher told news.com.au. In this case, you had templates of thousands of invoices. This company offers subscription services. You can see when the subscription is going to expire. So for example, you wait until about one month before it expires and say, hey, we're going to give you a 50% discount. And how many people would pay up if they saw that? Obviously a lot. Mr. Fowler said the documents contained details only the company and the homeowner would know. Location of smoke alarms, what type was there, the last date of work orders, so it provides that position of trust, he said. The customer slash victim wouldn't have any reason to suspect it was a scam. Scammers impersonate real businesses that the victim has previously interacted with and send through a bill for a service. They work in volume hoping that a tiny percentage of recipients are complacent enough to trust the unidentified number or email addresses asking them to foot a bill. The fraudulent invoices are sometimes sent via compromised email accounts of the business or through a fake email that closely resembles the legitimate business's email. Victims often only realise they've been scammed when the actual business follows up on an unpaid invoice. Okay, so this is how people can be very, very easily ripped off. So please uh, do make sure that if you or anybody that you know uh, has done or continues to do business uh, with that particular company, that you absolutely double check any invoices directly with the company, call them before you make uh, any payments. Now, here's the kicker. Right on the heels of that article, was another story that came out just today about a huge cyber gang bust that was actually a worldwide operation. So again, I urge everyone to please look this up so you're aware of what's going on. Uh, so this one is entitled Police Bust Global Cyber Gang Accused of Industrial Scale Fraud. Police have taken down a gang of a a gang accused of using a technology service that helped criminals use fraudulent text messages to steal from victims. They have arrested 37 people worldwide and are contacting victims. Officers say younger people who grew up with the internet were most likely to fall for the phishing scam. The technology allowed scammers without technical skills to bombard victims with messages designed to trick them into making payments online. Police targeted the gang's site lab host on the dark web, which helped criminals send the messages and direct victims to fake websites appearing to be legitimate online payment or shopping services. It has enabled the criminals to steal identity information, including 480,000 card numbers and 64,000 pin codes, known in criminal slang as fool's data, the police said. Detectives do not know how much, da how much money was stolen, but estimate the lab host site made nearly $1.25 million in profits. The arrests were a result with a result of a two-year operation involving the Metropolitan Police, National Crime Agency, City of London Police, and law enforcement bodies in 17 countries. Okay, so this again is really, really, really concerning. So again, please be aware of these types of uh, phishing scams, uh, be extra vigilant out there. And uh, most importantly, these articles should make it crystal clear to everybody watching this why we absolutely need to be pushing back as hard as we can against this digital ID and ensuring that we do not have our private personal information available online and in online apps and that kind of thing. So please, this is a very timely reminder if you haven't already done so, please make sure you add your signature to the uh, petition to repeal that Digital ID Act that was rushed through Parliament just a few weeks ago. Okay, this is the title of the petition that you want to search for. Take a screenshot now. Uh, if you're watching this on uh, Facebook, there should be a link going up in the comments section. If you're watching it on one of our other channels, just take a screenshot. 
do a search for that and make sure you add your signature. I mean, this when I last looked before I went on air tonight, it only had about 60 odd thousand signatures. This is insane. This is something that affects every single Australian. It should have millions and millions of signatures. So please add your signature and as always, once you've done that, share this video around or at the very least, share the links to that petition, share these articles around on as many different social media platforms as you can, on as many different uh, you know groups and chats and channels and everything else that you can. Let's get this message out there and let's put a stop to this insanity. Let's get that Digital ID Act that was raced through Parliament repealed and let's stop this in its tracks. Uh, now, as I've said uh, many times on these videos before, the digital ID is just one of the key stepping stones, okay, that the powers that be need to implement in order to finalise this uh, incessant push for this cashless society, which thankfully more and more people are waking up to and they are fighting back against like these very people here. Now, this is a, uh, a wonderful, heartwarming article, and uh, I urge you to have a look at this and, of course, support these businesses. Uh, it's uh, entitled, Defiant Cash Only Pub and Bakery Go Against Cashless Trend. Don't like it? I don't care. Uh, with card and contactless payments being the norm these days, there are a few places bucking the trend and standing their ground. Aussies can pay for almost anything with their card these days, but there are a few small businesses that will refuse that piece of plastic. In these places, you need cold, hard cash to get by, and they don't care that they're going against the rest of the country. The move towards a cashless society has, been, has seen hundreds of bank branches forced to close over the last year, 424 in the 12 months to June, and the banks say it's because people are not coming in. But Letitia Thomas and Sam James told Yahoo Finance that cash is king at their businesses, and they've decided to only accept physical money from customers. A lot of people are coming in from out of town and saying, thank God you're cash only. We just like to use cash, Thomas said. Thomas runs the Smoky Cap Super Bake Bakery in Southwest Rocks on the North, uh, New South Wales North Coast, which has been open for more than 12 years and has never accepted anything other than cash, which certainly goes against the grain. We don't have those extra fees associated with card purchases, she told Yahoo Finance. The girls are serving customers quicker as well. Imagine that, because all the media rubbish and the government says, oh, but card and tap and go so much quicker, yet here's a real business telling you in real terms that we're serving customers quicker by using cash. She said cash is better for her customers who are traditionally older and only buy a few bread rolls each. Blackouts or system issues that render some businesses powerless have no impact on Thomas. Thomas isn't the only one who's back who's bucking the cashless trend. Sam James has been running the King River Tavern in Albany, Western Australia, for more than two decades. It was only when she, was sh when she shut down the restaurant part of the pub in 2005 that she realised how much money she was spending on her FPOS machine. So she switched to being a cash-only pub and hasn't questioned that decision ever since. I just... Find it easy, she told Yahoo Finance. I have faith in my way to run my business the way I see fit. And I don't judge myself. I know that it's right for me. And if people don't like it, they cannot come here. I really don't care. So brilliant. I love it. Okay. I love that, uh, that attitude. Uh, and we should definitely be doing a shout out to each of those businesses, of course, on our Call Out Cashless Businesses Facebook group. Again, you'll find a link in the comment section or again, just do a search on Facebook. And again, let's continue to name and shame those businesses that refuse to accept cash and of course, promote businesses like that, especially those that are cash only. Uh, again, uh, time a reminder as well to join the Cash is King discussion group, which is the perfect place to post these videos, post those articles, have discussions about keeping cash alive, CBDCs, all of that stuff. Uh, and again, uh, just do a search on Facebook and you'll find that group. Now, as a final point on the topic uh, of cash or money, uh, we all know that this is ultimately being driven by the major banks purely 
purely as a way to boost their profits. Obviously, the more businesses and the more customers that use cards, the more the banks can charge on those card fees. Okay, the more branches that they close, the less they have to pay in wages, the more ATMs they remove, uh, the more people will likely you know, go to use cards, and so on and so on, that profit-making cycle continues. But it seems like the CBA have taken things a step further with their relentless pursuit for profit, and as a result, they've actually just now been hit with a $10 million fine. So again, I urge you all to have a quick look at this uh, article. Uh, it is entitled CBA fined $10.3 million for wage theft. In a, notable, uh, in a notable development for the finance industry, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, CBA, has faced hefty fines for long-standing wage discrepancies involving thousands of its staff members. The federal court has penalised the bank due to admissions that senior managers had been aware since 2010 Okay, so coming on to 15 years now, that workers were being underpaid, yet the bank failed to rectify the issue and misled staff about compliance with the law. This has been characterised as systematic conduct over a decade. The bank, along with its Comsec arm, has admitted to collectively underpaying 7,402 employees, a total of $16.1 million dollars from 2015 to 2021, all of which has been paid back with interest. The bank's reliance on individual flexibility arrangements, or IFAs, has been identified as a key factor in the underpayments. These IFAs remove certain entitlements such as rostered days off and overtime pay in return for higher pay and bonuses. However, the bank did not perform the necessary annual reconciliations to ensure that the IFAs resulted in staff being better off overall compared to the enterprise, enterprise agreements, leading to significant shortfalls. The Fair Work Ombudsman has taken on this case as one of its most significant underpayment cases, highlighting the systemic nature of the issue and pushing for substantial fines. Each breach could potentially attract fines of up to $660,000 under the Fair Work Act. The Ombudsman has stressed the responsibility of businesses to invest in their payroll systems, conduct audits and ensure compliance as a core governance requirement. Additionally, the bank is addressing a separate issue, because like that's not bad enough, they've got a separate issue, where it has agreed to back pay staff an estimated $3 million for failing to compensate for 10 minute tea breaks over a period of at least six years. The settlement includes payments to branch enterprise agreement employees and the introduction of a new system to record and compensate for untaken breaks. So uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, pretty important stuff. So uh, obviously if you or anyone that you know uh, works for the CBA, uh, please make sure that you're you know, aware of that and make sure that you are, have been properly uh, compensated to whatever it is that you're entitled to. And of course, for everybody else watching this, please understand the true you know, depth and breadth of this completely out of control corporate greed that exists in the world. I mean, this is just one very small example. It obviously happens you know, all day, every day across a range of industries with a range of big corporations. So uh, finally, as I always do at the end of uh, these videos, I'm gonna finish off with the uh, latest testimonial uh, from uh, one of our members, as well as some uh, more great memes uh, to get people thinking about what's going on. Uh, this one uh, is uh, from Diane. Uh, you can see here, uh, it's just, uh, hi, thanks for the quick response. After reading uh, several articles and responses on the KYR site, I purchased the Bank Secrets Revealed a book. I followed the steps, posted the letters, etc. I basically did not receive any correspondence from the two banks I was dealing with and wiped off $24,000 of credit card debt. $24,000 of credit card debt completely wiped off simply because of that four-step process from that Bank Secrets Reveal book. So please, if you've got any credit cards, if you've got any other unsecured loans, personal loans, things like that, 
grab that Bank Secrets book. Again, you'll find a description, uh, a link in the description to the video in the comment section and uh, stop throwing good money after bad at those debts. All right, so a couple of memes. Um, now, we did uh, touch on, obviously I can't say too much on these videos due to the good old fact checkers, which I'll get to in a second, uh, but we did talk about the uh, significant increase in cardiac arrests uh, and certain other things associated with that on this week's radio show. So if you missed that show, please make sure you uh, listen to the podcast. It has been uh, uploaded, uploaded to the podcast uh, members area now. But uh, I saw this and thought, yes, well, that follows on uh, quite well from that. And uh, I can certainly relate to that. And I'm sure that many others uh, out there uh, watching this can relate to this as well. And as it says there, I haven't been banned from Facebook in a long time. I suspect that my fact checker passed away suddenly and unexpectedly. Can't imagine what from, but uh, just saying. Now we keep hearing about the, uh, the EVs and the push for new electric vehicle legislation because of all the carbon emissions. Well, here is a very telling graph. Okay, there's China, front and center. Okay, with 30% of the world's carbon emissions in and of itself. Okay, then you've got the rest, you know, the US down here. Okay, and you've got the rest of the world over here. Okay, so just have a look at this for a moment. And yet they're telling you, okay, that you have to go and change your you know, gas guzzling vehicle to an EV because of the carbon emissions. Okay, clearly you can see where the carbon emissions are coming from. They're not coming out of your exhaust pipe. Let's just be crystal clear on that. Ah, uh, yes, I love this, and I can certainly relate to this, and hopefully many of you can as well. So uh, the little girl says there, um, Honey, what do you want to be when you grow up? A threat to the new world order, Mum. And that's uh, certainly what I'm planning on, and uh, hopefully uh, I'm uh, you know, well along the way uh, to achieve that outcome. And uh, finally, this is so, so important. I do want to leave everybody with this. Uh, you do have to make a choice and uh, hopefully you make the right one. So as it says, there are only two kinds of people, people who will do what they are told no matter what and people who will do what is right no matter what they are told. So I certainly hope that everybody watching this video falls into that latter category and will keep standing up for the truth, standing up for their rights, no matter what the media and the governments and the police and all the rest of the rubbish try and brainwash you and tell you is their version of right. You know what's right. You know within yourself what's right. So keep standing up for what you know is right. So I'm going to leave things there for tonight. As always, I do urge you to make use of all of the various resources, okay, to please get informed, get fired up and get proactive we need that uh, this year more than ever before. As always, there's tons of completely free information on our website, on the Know Your Rights Group website, on all the other websites uh, that we recommend. There's links in the description. These videos, of course, completely free to watch. You find them on our BitChute channel, on our YouTube channel, and the videos tab on our Facebook page. Uh, our radio shows, again, completely free to listen to every Tuesday night uh, between 8 and 10 p.m. Uh, we will be back again, of course, next uh, Tuesday with another big show. Uh, our live seminar, as I mentioned before, the Friday night is a completely free event. We do encourage everybody to attend for the whole weekend, for the whole two and a half days. Uh, but if for whatever reason you can't, at least get along to the Friday night event. Again, it's completely free. We cover a lot of information you know, in and of itself in that event. It's not just a big sales spiel for the rest of the weekend. It's actual valuable information uh, that you get from that night. And we're in each of the major cities uh, this year. Uh, so get along to those. Uh, of course, if you want to go above and beyond that, uh, we do urge you please uh, grab a copy of our uh, book, The Essential Step-by-Step -step Manual for Understanding and Exercising Your Rights. That Aussie Speeding Fines book that I mentioned before for uh, challenging all manner of unjust and unlawful fines. Uh, and again, that uh, Bank Secrets Revealed uh, book that I spoke about uh, just before as well. If you are struggling financially, stop throwing good money after bad at these unsecured loans, credit card loans. You can discharge them very, very simply with just a few basic letters that are all written. You just cut and paste your details into them. So again, there's links in the description uh, to get these all uh, separately. Uh, you can, of course, get them as part of the combo pack. 
uh, you do save a little bit of money with the combo pack. You get our uh, bonus uh, Know Your Rights tote bag uh, included uh, completely free of charge. Uh, don't forget, if you do want any of our CDs, DVDs, but you don't have a CD or DVD player in your computer, in your laptop, your PC, uh, you can get these uh, USB uh, CD, DVD drives. They'll work on a PC, on a Mac, on a laptop, uh, anything there. You can transfer the data from the disk straight onto a computer, onto a USB drive, anything like that. Uh, we do, of course, have our uh, caps and uh, beanies. They do have the, uh, the big, bright uh, Know Your Rights logo on them. People recognise them, they'll come up to you in the street, they'll start having a chat. It is a really great way to meet like-minded people uh, out and about out there. And uh, again, it's important to know that you're not the only ones thinking this way, you're not on your own. There are plenty of others out there that think the same way too, uh, despite what the uh, government and media try and tell you. And finally, as I said, if you can't get along to our live events for whatever reason, please at the very least make sure you grab a copy of our home study course. It is a complete recording of one of those two and a half day events. Uh, there's uh, 17 DVDs, uh, there's a a CD with all the documents that we use ourselves. There's three custom made workbooks with sections to write notes next to every single slide from every single presentation. You can pause, rewind, fast forward in the comfort of your own home at your own pace. Uh, and it's a great resource that you'll uh, come back to time and time again. So uh, that is it for me. I hope you all have a uh, fantastic weekend. We'll speak to you live on Tuesday night for the radio show. Again, no live video next Thursday due to Anzac Day, but we will be doing another live video next Sunday instead. Until then, take care.